Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Thursday, October 28th. It's 2010. It's Thursday. Good old normal standard. Nothing special about it Thursday, except that it's the Day 9 Daily number 207. Yeah, 207, where we learn to be a better gamer. I'm so excited, because we are doing... What I would call my roots of casting today, where we just go and we look at a pretty profoundly kick-ass game and talk about it. Um, of course, Fun Day Monday, Newbie Tuesday, and Friend Day Wednesday are all good fun and stuff. But traditionally, I'm out of town on Sundays and Thursdays as a result of casting, but not today. I am going out of town tomorrow, though. I'm going to Phoenix, Arizona to shoutcast the EG Masters Cup with our, our good friend and savior, DJ Heat whom I enjoy casting with quite a bit. And there will be some special events uh, planned for that. First of all, Bacon Explosion. Google it now. Now, Google Bacon Explosion. I'll be eating it. Oh, it's going to be good. And other exciting news, DJ Wheat and I will be casting all weekend. That's another one. Walking Dead is on on Sunday. Oh my god, we're going to be watching that. And most importantly for you viewers, on Sunday, there will be a Halloween special Day 9 Daily where I will be doing live coaching session of DJ Wheat, which should be really awesome. So the general setup is he's going to sit, and he's going to play a game, and without hearing me at all, I'm going to be doing commentary over it of things he should work on, and then I'm actually going to play a game, or he's going to play a game where I sit behind him, and I basically go, DJ Wheat, do this. DJ Wheat, don't do that. So he'll be going, ah, and screaming in his very DJ Wheatly sort of fashion. So without any further ado, allow me to drink some water. Good. And let's go into the daily. Here we are. We are seeing our good friend Artosis in the bottom right corner. And Artosis, you can tell, has very fast fingers. He's easily able to split his drones into pairs, so that's awesome. And we have Reniauer. 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 Um, I'm probably going to be saying that name as enthusiastically as that all game long, because why wouldn't you want to? Now, I just want to first note some basics. We are on the map, uh, map jungle basin, or basin, if you're from uh, England. It's a basin. Here is the, um, this is the good old place where you expand to. It is located behind your base. You have one neat ramp, which means if you defend this, you are set, baby. You can easily expand. There's these destructible rocks that you have to worry a little bit about, but not a really big, huge concern. There's some expansions peppering the map that we don't really need to go into too much. The most important things I want to say are one ramp blocks both main and natural expansion. Uh, some golds in the middle, some watchtowers. Oh, these actually used to be golds, but they're not golds anymore. So, we are in a Zerg vs. Protoss. We're going to pause. We're going to say to ourselves, what do Protosses hate? Alright, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time to think about it. Protosses, what do you hate in this matchup right now? I know you hate it. Think about it. Mm, uh -huh, that's right. Let that stir around in your brain a little bit. Mutas! Yeah, you hate mutas. You hate mutalisks because it feels like no matter what you make you lose badly um blink stalkers and a lot of pressure is one solution and that's for like very super high level players in control white raw have both beautifully executed pressure plus blink stalkers to combat this muta combination but especially for some of you folks who i would say are platinum level who are just really starting to have a lot of issues with this the direct unit counter seems the most reasonable the phoenix and i thought that this was an excellent illustration of zerg playing very very well and our protoss superhero using phoenix in a very clever way. And I will also, most importantly, not just be talking about, oh, get a phoenix, her Peter Peter, and that's that, right? There's a big layer of depth there, which is how we open, how we transition, and how all this sort of feeds together. And Artosis is going to be trying to expand. And I'm actually going to pause one more time, because this replay is, is a nice, clean, simple, straightforward replay. It's pretty short. Um, but... People tend to not really evaluate the game as, as a continuous string of time. They say, what's the best way to deal with mutas? And they go, phoenixes! Ta-da! You know, um, or even you'll hear me say something like, stalkers plus pressure is a good way to deal with mutalisks. Especially if you can pop blink out there. People will go, okay, cool, I, I just, that's what I do. And they're there, but done. 
But we really need to think of the game as a continuous string of time and what we do at all our points in time so that we can both mess with our opponent and have a next step to mess with our opponent. Best example of this ever, the one that everyone felt in their bones, is patch 1.1.2 point stuff. This is the patch where roaches got up to a range of six, reapers had to, ha or excuse me, barracks had to have a supply depot before you could make it, so reaper harass was shut down. Reaper nitro boost pack requires a factory. Ugh, ugh, oh my god. And interestingly enough, a lot of Terran buddies suddenly felt that I don't have a good way to play against Zerg. The opening, as it turned out, was integral into what you could do as your next step. Five Racks Reaper. Note that once you are done going Five Racks Reaper, you have five barracks. So maybe it's a good idea to make a whole bunch of Marines and Marauders. Now, if you even watch tomorrow play at Gamescom, at the Intel Extreme Masters Global Challenge Cologne at Gamescom, you noted that he would get a ton of Marines and Marauders and continue to put on pressure. And oh my goodness, how well that works. Suddenly nowadays, it seems like that that doesn't work so well. Why is that? Well, it's not that Zerg suddenly has the counter to Marines and Marauders. This is what actually was going on. Uh, the Terran would put so much pressure on with the Five Racks Reapers that Marines and Marauders, despite their deficiencies were the easiest follow-up. Zerg was already in a battered position, and that was the giant knuckle to punch Zerg in the face to finally whomp him over. Very important you notice that the Reapers did the damage, and what do I have left over? Barracks, so I can finally do the finishing killer blow. If you're Terran and you just kind of get five Barracks now, without putting on any pressure, and then try to move out, Zerg has a lot of freedom to get Bane Links, to put up Mutilus Harass, to possibly put you down. Suddenly the Marines and the Marauders, just by getting them, it's not nearly as good. There's a connection between those two, and I definitely hope that a lot of Terran players have felt that. So we want to be talking lots about these connections that Rini is making. Because I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to get phoenixes. And it is not that he gets phoenixes that is good. It is how he gets phoenixes and what he does before then. And most significantly, what he does afterwards. So, rainy hour does the most annoying thing in the world. Plop a pylon. Artosis. Ugh, ugh, you can even see the rage in this drone as it goes at it because it's red with anger. But of course, Artosis does the smart thing. Plants down a spawning pool. We're going to notice little things like, okay, I couldn't get the hatch down. I will then build my pool. Can I put my hatch down yet? Yes. Well, then I'll put the hatch down. If no, then I'll just put an extractor down. He's slowly planting little pieces to his overall puzzle in whatever order he can. He would like to plant the bigger piece of the extract, or excuse me, of the hatchery, but instead just gets the pool and the extractor as he appropriately can. Go Artosis! And meanwhile, we see Rini Hour doing very smart things in his own right. Looks like he doesn't quite have the biggest expenditure of Chrono Boost. He has a lot of energy staved up. But yeah, getting a Zealot! He might be doing a little bit of pressure with it, as we can see by that implied rally line. Yeah, he's going to be getting a Cyber Core. Awesome! Second gas. Perfecto! Yep, there's the Warp Gate going down. Looks like he is going to back up. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a sentry en route, and Protoss is doing everything that is all good and normal in the world. Links come to do the finishing blow. Artosis did get a little bit delayed on that. Again, he would have liked to plant down that hash first, but he's going to go ahead and get a queen. He's going to go ahead and get his overlords up. He's going to go ahead and get his zergling speed, and in the end... Everything lines up nice and normally. Looks like he's delaying that speed a little bit to get that queen out. Perfecto, perfecto. So it looks like our Protossi is going to be doing... A, by the way, this little rally pattern I think is quite nice because a lot of times people will just right-click rally here. They will have the arrow point from here, from bottom left of this rectangle to the top right. And the problem is that the sentry pops out here where it just gets killed and then you get red-cheeked. So do these little sorts of things. So he's going to be setting himself up a nice little expansion. I think every Protoss in the universe says, yes, great. This wall off with the one Zealot and the one Sentry is good. There is another Sentry en route. I think this is the most important concept of economy management possible. You have two resources. Minerals and gas. No one will disagree. And if they do, then they're probably playing another game. Um, anytime you're saying... I'm spending a lot of gas. You should be saying, how do I make up for my minerals? 
Or you can say something like, hey, if I make a lot of gas-heavy units, I have minerals freed up to do minerally-ish things. Always think about this balance. Oh my god, think of this balance. For instance, if you are Kiwikaki and you are doing the Kiwikaki PvP style, it's going to involve lots of zealots and stalkers. You know what you don't need when you do that? I want you to say it. Gas! Very good! You don't really need a lot of gas to go just zealots and stalkers. So, why are you making another geyser? That's right. Why'd you do that? Shouldn't have done that. Very easy way to free up resources. Make a lot of sentries, and then with the excess minerals, throw down a nexus, right? Honestly, a lot of people think that the sentries are part of the build. They think that, oh, the sentries are the unit that will let you make force fields and lets you push. Don't overcomplicate it. Sentries cost a ton of gas. Next eye costs a lot of minerals. So since you're getting a lot of minerals and gas, that is a reasonable split. Most players would probably prefer... Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's Thursday, October 28th, 2010. I had a total system crash. That's the way it works. And we are back to part two of Day 9 Daily number 207 with Artosis vs. Reedy Hour. We're looking at a game here on Jungle Bassin. And the big thing that I was emphasizing right before, oh my god, right before the crash, apparently I was at warp speed. All right, slowing it back down. This is great, this little mix of getting sentries and then expanding because it's a good way to spend a lot of gas on uh, sentries. And with all the freed up minerals, you take an expansion very quickly. Now, what most people do in this circumstance is, I mean, I love that Rini Hour is getting his warp gate really fast. I'm actually going to ignore hallucination for almost the whole game, actually. I have pretty much zero desire to gripe on Hallucination. Um, people will will overthink this. And you heard me talk a lot about in yesterday's Daily, people tend to overcompensate. They'll see three Mutalisks and make 20 Spore Crawlers and Queens and all this jazz to defend. Way over expenditure. And likewise, when people see things that they find unusual when they're trying to learn, they go, oh, I don't do that. Maybe I should be getting hallucinate every single game. And that is not the point of what Rini Hour is doing. That is not the important part. Ignore this. What I will say is what most people do is most people go three gates and then expand. Uh, this is fine to go warp gate, expand, and then get three gateways. Uh, we're going to be seeing Rini Hour do that in a second. Yep, there's one gateway going down. There's another. And again, we can spend a very few minerals and lots of gas making sentries and spend all our remaining minerals on gateways. We were originally spending minerals on the Nexus, and now we're going to be spending minerals here. Protosses tend to continue this theme by taking gases very fast the expansion and just getting as many sentries as they want till they're blue in the face. Um, and then they can come back and make units. So in the meantime, Artosis is playing quite well, as he is known to do. For any of you who did not know, Artosis is also extremely good at StarCraft, in addition to being a suave nerdballer commentator with my equally suave nerdballer brother, Nick. Uh, or as I know him, Nicky! Um, so, yep, he's making drones, he's getting his spire up, and notice Artosis is kind of broke on money, but we're going to see a swell of money forward as he is making... Uh, I should be making overlords. Actually, a little bit of a blunder there. But ordinarily, it catches up pretty adequately. Now, this is the first interesting thing that we see Rini Hour do. Now, I just want to go to the Rini cam. Look at what he sees. Basically, nada, right? And not OGS nada. Literally nothing, right? He just... He has some sentries at the front for defense. He's making some spotters over here so he can see if he has a threat at his back door. And he's just blindly getting stargates. The big thing I was emphasizing in part one, before it crashed, was um, it is so important that you understand the connection between what's going on. It is not just phoenixes are good against mutilists. Yeah, phoenixes! So what I'm going to say right now, Rini Hour is getting phoenixes blind. Blind as a bat. You, you, and that's good. That's great. Sometimes people over, uh, over predict their opponent. They go, well, I've seen Artosis go mutas in 10 games. Let me just get eight Stargates and make as many Phoenixes as I can. And then I will have gotten a win against Artosis. And then you post it on a replay site and gloat to yourself. Bad, bad viewer. 
What you really want to do is say to yourself, well, since I'm getting this blind, I'm going to be great against Mutalisks, and how will I deal with other strategies? How will I deal with if he's going Hydra as well? We're seeing a little bit of this now. Looks like the Hallucinate allows for a kind of early scout. If he saw, say, a lot of roaches, he could get Void Rays right now. He's going to get some Phoenixes right off the bat anyways, because Phoenixes are great units, right? So three gates making units. And then two Stargates making Phoenixes and a Forge. So now it looks like Rini Hour has seen that Artosis has himself a Spire. We see many Omutars coming up. Artosis, look at how low that Queen's Energy is. Fantastical, legendary Artosis like. One cannon at each point. And I actually would like to emphasize how awesome that is as well. One cannon here and one cannon back here. Also getting the uh, the weapon upgrade for air. That's very, very awesome. Uh, obviously, it's going to let us Phoenixes do a little bit more magic. Now, we're going to see Artosis do some uh, fairly interesting things coming up very soon. Artosis is actually expanding here instead of the more typical expanding here. Now, this location is a little easier to defend because look at how short the path is back to your main and your natural. It's, it's closer distances. But Artosis, we're going to talk about what Artosis is doing good for a minute. Artosis is making a lot of Mutalisks, we can see selected here. Uh, Mutalisks are super fast. They are super fly, literally. They fly around. So if you expand to opposite locations of the map, then you can easily defend with your super mobile Mutalisks. If you had really slow Hydras off creep, you'd want to be expanding close. If you expand all the way over there... He just kills it and then walks home without ever encountering any of your uh, units. But really, this works out quite, quite well to be in this good old setup. So I do like that Artosis is performing this little technique. And now likewise, Artosis has the choice of eventually getting a lot of Zerglings or expanding more. We'll talk about that as it comes up. But either way, now Rini Hour knows that he is getting uh, a lot of Phoenixes at this point because he sees Mutas, so he's going to constantly make those. He's going to make some units out of here. He's going to be getting upgrades eventually out of here. Again, one cannon. One cannon, not too much expenditure because he is getting a lot of Phoenixes. Again, no reason to over-prepare over for those Mutas. You have Phoenixes, you don't need... A ton of phoenixes and a ton of cannons and a ton of stalkers. A lot of phoenixes are going to do just great. Now, if we pretend for a moment that our opponent was going hydras or was going roaches, the number of phoenixes we have at the time we have them can do a lot of damage, lifting up queens, killing them off, picking off a ton of drones. He'll, he'll have to play a lot more defensively so we can get an advantage that way. Every time we see a strategy that's working directly, in other words, phoenixes kill mutalisk straight up, we want to see how he would perform against other strategies we would have to fight indirectly. If he's going a lot of Hydralisks, we probably have to... Uh, we don't want to directly lift all his Hydras in the air, because he probably has so many that will kill us. We kind of want to indirectly poke and prod around, abuse how slow Hydras are, pick off Overlords, pick off Queens, pick off Drones. Perfecto. That is how we want to continuate that. Not sure if continuate is a word, but... Uh, it is, of course, a tradition on the Day 9 Daily that we make up as many words as possible, such as bejujular, kaloxin, uh, persnigitate is one that I uh, defined and forgot the definition to. So if anyone could just let me know what I called that, that would be great. Now, Artosis is doing something very interesting. I have the production tab open. Many of you Protosses who hate mutalisks also hate the fact that there's a million Zerglings on the field. Artosis... Again, most of his gas being spent on Mutalus. How does he spend the minerals? Could have spent it on Zerglings, but instead he's spending it on expanding and expanding again. Expands to two opposite locations, further abusing how mobile Mutalisks are. Phoenixes from Arena Hour are having to be rather careful with their positioning. And we're going to actually see Artosis not make that many Zerglings. With his minerals, he's going to be spending it on more drones. Now, I want you to also note how low Rini Hour's food is. He is actually quite low on food. Going to try to catch up. He's going to do it with excellent strategery. There's the other a similar going down. There's a Twilight Council going down. Very good stuff. Now, Artosis is committing pretty big on the air front. We even see him getting Corruptors. Corruptors are a little mineral heavy as well. They require a lot of gas, a lot of minerals. So, pretty much what we're going to see is Artosis is spending a lot of money on maintaining air control. Seems, seems a little um, counterintuitive to just, you know, be against Phoenixes and to say, alright, well, I'm just going to keep making Mutalus, but it's actually quite smart. He wants to just 
absolutely dominate the air because if he dominates the air, he can control these expansions. We're going to see Rini Hour do something a little bit straightforward. He's going to be making a lot of Phoenixes, right? Making a lot of Phoenixes. He's going to try to battle for air control too. Does he? Is he getting any more upgrades? No. A little expensive to get the fleet beacon just for the plus two attack upgrade. But either way, he's going to continue massing. And as we see in production, Artosis is basically making air. Air upgrades and drones. And there's a little harassment that's oh so good. This sort of harassment that Rainy Hour is doing would be way better if he was against a Hydralisk player that couldn't uh, connect quite as easily. Rainy Hour is going to be a little bit careful with those rallied in Mutalisks, but obviously doing a good amount of damage. Now look at production. Artosis making a lot of drones. He even swept over here and saw that there were not that many Zerglings, mainly Mutalisks. So we're seeing Rainy Hour make a lot of Stalkers. Now this makes a lot of sense. If our opponent is dedicating himself to huge numbers of air, sure we're going to get the Phoenixes. How do we bolster that? With Stalkers. Now, you heard me say, anytime you see the direct thing happen, he's making, he started making Phoenixes, his opponent responded by making a lot of air, aggressively going for air with the Corruptors and the Mutalisks. So he, in a very direct way, made Stalkers. Now I want everyone to pause for a moment and ask yourself, what if our Zerg buddy was not making so much air, was still making just Mutalisks, maybe not so many Corruptors, but was making a lot of Zerglings? I'll let you think while I get some water. Oh. Yeah, you make way more Zealots and devote a little more gas to getting plus attack upgrades so you can really rip through the Zerglings. Wow, how intuitive our build is ending up being. This is going to be fantastic. This is great. Hell, if we were up against Hydras, we could even do something quite similar to what Rini Hour is doing. Look at the food. He's still quite behind. Uh, he's getting the Zealot with leg charge. That is fantastic. Zealots with legs are great in this mix. This is just a very, very clever little way to play. In the meantime, Artosis in production, still getting drones, setting up this expansion. There's a Hallucination doing a little bit of scouting there as well. Still not the biggest fan of Hallucination in this game. Perhaps if we threw down like nine Hallucinated um, Immortals, I would, I would be a bigger fan of that. We have quite a few sentries out on the field. We actually have four sentries down. And it looks like Rainy Hour is going to be making up his big ground army. There he just finished his plus one attack. Would prefer to see more attack going down. And this is actually a pretty traditional look to this Phoenix play, where we're trying to do as much harassment as we can. Picking off little bits against Mutas, we can't do as much damage in the harassment, but we can do a lot of damage in the direct battle. So we also want to be making lots of Stalkers and Zealots. How awesome. And this is just very, very good pressure that Rini Hour is doing. Every build should have some good form of pressure. If you didn't go Phoenixes, and you instead went for five Warp Gates relatively early on, you should be putting pressure on by just moving out. Freaking your Zerg opponent out, and then backing back home again. Very, very intuitive, right? But you need to put that pressure on. With Phoenixes, it's a little more obvious, because you can dart in, you can dart out. I would also recommend that you lift up Zerglings that are just sort of outlying here, completely shut down any scouting. And interestingly enough, Rini Hour is still a little bit behind, because Artosis has been having to make so many drones. Look, still making drones. There's not a lot of drones here. There's not a lot of drones here. Uh, there's a decent amount here, and there's a decent amount in the main as well. But Rini Hour been putting on good pressure. Expanding when he attacks. So good. And notice how this army bolsters uh, each uh, different element quite well. The, the phoenixes are obviously going to help out with these mutas quite a ton. Like, like hugely, and the ground army is going to help the phoenixes against that. But also, if there's a bunch of roaches or hydras on the ground, and Artosis had made some sort of giganto switch, he could do a lot of lifting with these phoenixes. This is a very, very solid little way to play. And there's, of course, the zealots popping out, trying to do some damage. Look at the corruptor count. That's very, very intimidating. Artosis was very smart to do this little counterattack. I actually like that quite a bit. Corruptors need to be doing a little bit more corrupting, and oh, this honestly, if this path were not here, Protoss would be in a much weaker spot, because he wouldn't be able to retreat back smartly like this. 
And Rainy Hour is just making a good amount of ground units, getting himself Supply Block to touch. He has some extra money, but that money was money that was uh, returned to him because he canceled this expo. So that's that's actually not something I care about so much. Is, he, is this a plus two? Yeah, I really wish that plus two was out a lot faster. I think this would have been a lot more helpful. But suddenly, in this direct bout, notice how many Stalkers there are with the Phoenixes. Stalkers and Phoenixes, so good against a lot of Corruptors and a lot of Mutalisks. And again, I want you to just picture in your head, if we saw our opponent going Mutalisk and we started to get the Phoenixes, and instead of expanding a lot with those minerals, our Zerg opponent was making a lot of units, making a lot of Zerglings in particular with those minerals, then we should just get a ton more Zealots in our SKU. Obviously, Stalkers are a good unit. You can get them against Zerglings as well. But here comes the big battle going on. Phoenix is doing a lot of damage, just backing them up, so that way maybe the Stalkers absorb the brunt of the damage while the Phoenixes can deal the brunt of the damage. And this is something that you will find happening a lot. Rini Hour demolishes the ground battle, but loses the air battle. We can see here three Phoenixes, and look at Artosis' air control. He has a ton of stuff. Even in the unit counting station, we can see 16 mutas and four um, corruptors still alive. That is total air domination. It's what Artosis wanted in the first place. But Rini just says, okay, cool. I'll just win on ground and have more stalkers. Ping! If, for some reason, your Zerg opponent opted to make a lot of, um, a lot of mutalisks, and you decide to make a lot of zealots, and he was going mainly Muta Zergling, same kind of thing would happen. You would probably lose the Phoenix battle, but you would have 30 zealots left over, and you'd do a ton of damage. And then it's the second wave that would come in and win. That happens a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, when someone's, like, desperately trying to go for the air control. And likewise, if you decided to go three Starport Phoenixes and only Stalkers... You would probably demolish in the air battle, and you would lose ground control. I'm not necessarily saying that's bad, but that's just kind of the way that this sort of thing happens when someone's doing huge Muta Force and huge Zergling Force. And as we can see, Rainy Hour proceeds to clean up all the Mutas, and as usual, a ton of Zealots left over, and this is the exact look that you want to be in. Now look at all these useless Corruptors that did nothing but help Artosis maintain air control, and they really cannot contribute to this fight. And we even see how many of these guys are corrupted. We see the, basically, the BO is what I call it, like the, the green ooze erupting from them. There is the plus two. Still, I think that's so late. The Corruptors are going to come and uh, just look around a little bit. Artosis trying to re-expand, trying to make some Zerglings, but we can even see that he's behind on the Ling upgrades. Not necessarily a big mistake. I just think that Rini Hour played this out very, very nicely. It was a big timing push when he moved out. It wasn't any sort of early aggressive uh, movement with any zealots or stalkers. It was instead this one big final push plus his phoenixes. And even if he did lose it, he just would have been able to expand. And I just think that this style of play is a, a, a very, very nice way... <laughs> Whoops, no GG. <laughs> I think it's a very, very nice way to deal with the phoenixes in a or deal with the mutalisks in a direct way with your phoenixes but if for some reason he doesn't go for some huge mutalisk number he instead just says screw you take air control i'm gonna go roaches and hydras you can always back up do a lot of harassment with the phoenixes and come out with a similar sort of look skewing towards either zealots or stalkers in the way you please i just thought it was a nice little strategy that i would do an intro to and we will take some questions yeah uh, let's see here, let's see here. And honestly, I think that that was a very smart way that Artosis played that game out. I just think Rini played a little bit better. Artosis was quite brilliant with his uh, pacing of expanding and going for air control. That's a lot more of a strategist way of thinking and a lot um, less of a, oh, I saw that and I'll just sort of copy that way of thinking. This is kind of what I mean. A lot of people who go mutalists just kind of go, well, I saw that mutas were good. So I'll just kind of make mutas, and I'll just swing around the backside. Yeah. And uh, for any of you fine folks, I wonder if you have had this problem where you kind of get the mutalisk because you saw someone else get the mutalisk, and you kind of fly around with them, and they feel strong, but your mind is only thinking about the mutalisks. What Artosis did there that I like is he thought about the resources. I'm spending all this gas 
on Corruptors and Muta, so I'm going to spend my minerals on expanding to smart locations so I can get even more gas to maintain this dominance of the air. Uh, and if he had just made a few extra spine crawlers and been a little bit more resilient with his scouting, he probably would have overpowered the air and his mutilus would have been able to overpower the ground. So I'm going to take questions, questions, questions. Okay, here's a great question from Hyperion 2010. Dear Day 9, I find it very hard to use phoenixes because I have relatively low hand speed. Is there some way to use highly microable units without slipping on macro because of low hand speed? Most important thing in the world is a smart hockey setup. That is so friggin' damn important. Holy crap. For me, phoenixes have a special place in control group 4. Doesn't matter if I'm only using control group 1 and 2 and 3 is totally available. Control group 4 are my phoenixes. Control group 5 is going to be my um my gateways, right? 0 and 9 are going to be my nexuses. I'm not arguing that that's the best one. But that is the mental model I have used for ages in this matchup. For so long. Four is my money units, you know. Even even in other matchups, like one, two, and three are units. Four are investors. One, two, and three are units. Four is my drop that I'm doing. And you don't really need amazing hand speed to be able to make use of this little mental model you've set up for yourself. So... Getting a good um, uh, hockey setup and sticking to it. Oh my god, stick to it. Sometimes players go, all right, I'll use control four. And then they'll go back to clicking on the minimap, boxing, clicking and boxing and clicking and boxing, when they could just easily go four, move here. Zero E, nine E, I am now making probes. Zero CC, I'm chrono boosting. Five, five, I'm at my warp gates. Throwing those sorts of things down. The most important thing, though, is you're gonna do poorly in your first few games doing it you're just gonna <laughs> there's no reason not to accept this fact phoenixes do take a lot of focus and hand speed not as much as it feels but they do take some some finesse to work with so just say i'm fine with losing some games building my finesse probably four or five games will feel not so good but very quickly like i mean by games six seven eight nine ten oh you'll be feeling an all good zone so I'm gonna take some a little bit of uh, a little bit of sipping. Hmm. Terra sentiments says, "Dear Day Nine, it seems that in this game, something I would have done if I were Artosis that I didn't see is to get Infestors. I think Fungal Growth would have been fantastic against these Phoenixes." Thoughts? Now, it's actually a lot closer than it seems because you heard me gripe on the idea of. It's about how you get to that point and then what you do after that point. Not so much what's happening at that point itself. Obviously, if an infester were on the field and you managed to get some phoenixes, your air could clean it up nicely. However, here's the thing that's going through Artosis' mind. Why spend like 150 gas per infester and all the gas on the infestation pit and all the trying to position around when I could just keep getting mutilisks. I could get more mutilisks. I could still maintain the same uh, little bit of air control. And then I could, yeah, I could just do what I want to do, get air control and expand. I don't even need the infestors in the first place. And that's actually what we saw that game. The Phoenixes really didn't give Artosis that much trouble at all, really. He was able to repel them. They killed off maybe 8, 9, 10 drones, but he was easily pushing the Phoenixes back and back and back. So why do that? And that's actually the sign of good strategy. A good strategy is not, how can I add anything more? It's about, can I take anything more away? You want to have the leanest strategies possible. Now, that said, I think what Artosis should have done is actually cut back on the Corruptors. And the reason I would always opt to do that test before I do the infester test is because uh, it's very little changing going on in Artosis. He just hits the T button a couple times instead of the corruptor button. So he ends up with more mutilisks and as a result can deal with those stalkers at the end more because the stalkers were really what were giving Artosis trouble. If he got the infestors, he may very well have gooped up the phoenixes, killed them off, gone hooray, and then lost even worse to the um, 
stalkers and the zealots coming out. So that is that is that is my fear there. For me, I want to be very slow with the change. You notice Artosis did get four bases up pretty easily. He did get his upgrades. He was getting a lot of drones and playing defensively very well. So the change he wants to make is not something that'll throw all that other great jazz away. It'll be a change that's easy to do. I already have the Spire, just we'll shift a little bit more towards the Muta composition. We're going to take one more question and end this slightly shorter daily. Let us see here. Um, uh, I'll actually take two more questions. L, L, L Primo Optimus, there we go, says, Dear Day9, you said that you liked Artosis expanding to the edges of the map. Do you think it would be vital to also have links? Now, it would, it would be awesome if the lings were there, but it's hard to get a lot of lings when you do what Artosis did. Artosis took two additional expansions, one at the left, one at the right, very, very quickly, very close to one another in time. So if he wants to make use of them, he has to spend the minerals on drones. He's spending minerals on hatches, minerals on... Um, queens, minerals on the extra drones, minerals on the spine crawlers, minerals on the extractors to, uh, yeah, minerals on the extractors. When does he actually have the minerals to build those links, let alone the larva? That's, that's the hard part for me. Yeah, sure, if he had a bunch of links, that would have been great, but... The, the danger is to take those expansions and say to yourself, yeah, well, I know lings would probably be useful here, and you make a bunch of zerglings, and then you have two expansions with no drones mining and a lot of zerglings. Not a good spot to be in. We will take one more question. One, one more question. What are all these questions about? Hmm. Hmm. I'll take this question by Enforce. It says, Dear Day 9, what about Archons early on when you have two to three Archons with no Templar upgrades off two bases? It could be pretty strong against Mutaling. Am I wrong in this? Or are Archons underused for a reason? Um, I definitely think that they could be good. Most important thing is to just test them. Because... Theory crafting is fun. It's fun to sit around and go, is there a way for me to only go queens and spine crawlers until I'm at the 50 food mark? And to think about that. But there does come a point where it all sounds good, so sit down and test it. I mean, hell, Artosis on paper, that sounds great in that game. I'm just going to get a lot of mutas and corruptors and expand a bunch with my minerals and drone up, and I'm eventually going to have so many mutalists, there's not much he can do with it, because phoenixes are only okay against corruptors and mutas, and stalkers tend to lose to mutalists quite badly when you get enough of them, so uh, it sounds great on paper, but in practice, it seems like there's a little bit of a hole. With the Archon one, ha, huh, Archons sure do sound good against mutaling, especially because you can get so many speed zealots. Will it work? Test it! Test it! I would, of course, say that in your testing, be aware of the fact that Archons are slow, cannot get back to vulnerable expansions easily, so Mutalists can pick them off without much trouble. It is now 7.55. I am going to go eat chicken. See you later, guys. And again, special Halloween show. I'm going to be in Phoenix, Arizona at um, the EG Masters Cup. And for Sunday, we will be doing the Halloween special where DJ Wheat plays games and gets live coached by Day 9. Bow! See you on Sunday. And of course, tune in that weekend for the EG Masters Cup.